chronic venous insufficiency. Chronic means it's an ongoing condition. Venous sits to do with the veins. And insufficiency means there is not enough physiological function in the veins for the body's venous drainage requirements. Now this is relatively common actually. It's been estimated that between two and 5% of the total population suffers from symptomatic chronic venous insufficiency. And uh, well, at least 40% have some regurgitation problems in veins causing varicose veins and things like that. So what's going on here? Well, we need to think about our basic anatomy and uh, physiology. We have the three main veins, three, three main systems of veins in the limbs. And here they are, the superficial, the deep and the perforator veins. Now this is the periphery down here and the blood needs to move back up to the centre of the body up here. And to make sure that there's one way flow of blood, the veins have valves. These valves are bicuspid. They have two cusps. And they will let the blood flow from here up the way, but then the valves will swing shut if there's any back pressure of the blood. So a valve is a structure which ensures one way, one way flow of blood. And actually these valves aren't that substantial. They're just infolds of the inner lining of the blood vessel, the tunica interna. So they're actually fairly thin folds. The vein walls themselves would be a bit uh, thicker. The tunica media and the tunica externa. So this will be the walls of the veins. The walls aren't as thick as arteries, but you know, they are reasonably substantial walls. That's what you've got to stick your needle through when you're doing venipuncture, of course. Now, these perforator veins are so called because they perforate the muscle fascia. So the deep veins are inside muscles. So here we have a muscle and the deep veins are inside the muscle. So this is all muscle here. Calf muscle perhaps in the leg. So these veins are inside the muscle and they perforate the muscle fascia. The muscle fascia is the layer of tough fibrous tissue over the top of the uh, over the top of the muscle. Sometimes these veins are called communicator veins because they communicate between the superficial and the deep systems. Some people actually call them uh, anastomotic veins because they form a, an, an astomosis. But they also contain valves in this direction. Now the thing to grasp here is the superficial veins are relatively low pressure. They're the low pressure system, whereas the deep veins, the pressure can be high. There can be high pressure. And there's valves inside the deep veins as well. And again, they're pointing in this direction because we want the flow to go from the periphery back towards the center. So again, this means blood can flow from here through to here. But then if there's any back pressure in the blood there, that will shut those valves, preventing regurgitation. So at least that is the, uh, that's the physiological situation. That's what happens normally. So normally, blood will be coming into, uh, well, some blood will drain straight into the deep veins or the blood will drain into the superficial system, such as the saphenous veins, for example. And the blood will go from there to there. And then when it tries to go back, that valve will shut and it won't let it go. Now, what happens here is um, when this muscle 
contracts, that muscle contracts. And when the muscle contracts, it shortens. So muscle contraction is going to greatly increase the pressure of the blood inside the deep veins. So this muscle is going to contract and squeeze on that vein. It's going to close that vein off like that. It's going to close it off, greatly increasing the pressure. Now, if you increase the pressure in this compartment here, you increase the pressure of blood in that compartment there, what's that going to do to this valve? Well, it's going to close that valve. So that valve will be closed, preventing regurgitation, but that valve will be opened so the blood will go up, back towards the center. And muscle contraction is an active process. It's a vigorous process. So when that happens, the blood scoots back up, the contraction of the muscles. But then when the muscle relaxes, the walls of the vein are going to tend to open again, and that's going to reduce the pressure in here. And when the pressure in there is reduced, the blood is going to go from the low pressure system through the perforator, veins into the high pressure system. Then that will contract, that blood will shoot back up very quickly and efficiently. When the muscle relaxes, that's going to open the vein, lowering the pressure, sucking more blood in. So all the time we have blood going from the superficial veins through to the deep veins, through the perforator veins. And of course, this is the normal situation. This is what happens normally. But in chronic venous insufficiency syndrome, these valves do not function properly. There is disorder of the valves within the veins. And a common cause for this is that perhaps further up, further up in this system, in fact, very commonly, the pathology starts where the great saphenous vein joins the femoral vein up near the inguinal ligament at the top. Then the blood kind of progressively dams back. But let's imagine that that's a valve further up. Then what can happen is there's a condition called a deep venous thrombosis. A DVT, of course. Now, in a DVT, what happens is, um, well, a thrombus uh, is where there's blood clotting where it shouldn't, so you'll get blood clotting around about a valve, typically around about a valve. And that's a deep venous thrombosis. And these are probably more common than we think. There's probably quite a lot of DVTs which don't give rise to the classic clinical features of DVTs that we uh, learn to recognise, such as the swelling and the redness and the pain. But what these deep venous thromboses will do is they will damage this valve. They will damage the valve. So if that valve is damaged, then the blood can regurgitate back the way. This is pathological. It's not supposed to go back the way. And if the blood is coming back the way here, what's that going to do to the pressure on this valve? Well, I think you can see it's going to increase the pressure in that valve. So you can get a sort of a cascade effect down through the valves. Now, in practice, this pathological process often starts with the um, superficial veins. About 80% of cases of chronic venous insufficiency, it starts with the superficial veins, damage to the valves in the superficial veins. It can, it can be both. It can be the deep and the superficial systems that are involved. But but let's imagine now that there's a problem with the valves. And other set a lot of valves that often go wrong are in these perforator. These perforator valves go wrong. So let's think the perforator valves have gone wrong now. If the perforator valves aren't working properly, when the muscle contracts, that's going to increase the pressure there. Yes, some of the blood will scoot off there. The valve in the deep vein is more likely to be intact, so that's going to be okay. The blood won't go back. But if those valves in the perforator veins aren't working, can you see the blood's going to go back from the high pressure deep venous system into the low pressure superficial system? And that will engorge these veins with blood and they can become dilated 
and tortuous the varicosed situation. But whenever the valves aren't working, that's going to increase the pressure, particularly in the superficial veins. So there's going to be raised venous pressure. There's going to be venous hypertension. So chronic venous insufficiency can lead to chronic venous hypertension. caused by the failure of the valves. And DVT, whether symptomatic or silent DVT, is a common cause of this. Sometimes this used to be called post-thrombotic syndrome, it's a simplification, but... Other times there can be um, this one. Phlebitis, that is inflammation in the veins often caused by bacterial infection, but the inflammation in the veins is likely again to damage the valves, causing valvular incompetence. Other times people are just born with poor quality veins. Congenital, or poor quality valves anyway. In fact, some people are born without valves at all and have this uh, quite severely from, from early life. So they're common conditions that can lead to this syndrome because they damage the valves. There's an increase in the pressure of the blood. There's regurgitation of blood into the superficial venous system. So where the pathology begins doesn't matter too much if it begins in a superficial vein or if it begins in a deep vein. If it began in a deep vein, for example, I think you can see that the increased pressure there would put a lot of pressure on the perforator valves and over time that they, they, they would fail because of the increased pressure and we're going to get this venous hypertension particularly in the superficial veins causing varicosity and other other clinical features that we'll look at so what else can lead to this condition well we know it's more common in developed countries Probably due to lifestyle factors. We know it's more common with uh, increasing age. But there again, most things are. There's more time for things to go wrong. And we know it's associated often after uh, pregnancy. Now, the reason here, we used to think it was because the gravid uterus was very large and pressed on the inferior vena cava and that caused back pressure but now it's believed to be a, a progesterone effect. The hormone, a progesterone. Like all conditions, there's a family history. If your mum or your dad had it, it's more likely you'll get it. Obesity is a problem. The obesity is caused by um, compression of the veins, particularly the inferior vena cava. Because of course, if this goes on to become the femoral vein, that's going to drain into the iliac and then the inferior vena cava. There's debate over standing, but some research shows that people that stand a lot in their occupations, there's a lot of back pressure, especially if they can't walk around very much. Other research studies show that that's not particularly a big factor, but it probably is a small factor, or certainly a, or a bigger factor in people that are genetically predisposed to it. Uh, smoking. Studies have shown that smoking is a etiological factor, a causative factor in, in men at least. Although overall this condition is more common in, in women, perhaps because of the progesterone effect. And then there's injuries direct injury to the veins damaging the valves and also I've seen this with indirect injury a patient who had a fixation of the ankle joint and because they couldn't move their ankle they were unable to use the calf muscle pump effectively and they developed chronic venous hypertension and 
chronic venous insufficiency syndrome. So it all depends, the normal venous drainage all depends on these valves working properly. Venous drainage is facilitated by contraction of adjacent skeletal muscles, contraction of adjacent arteries, pulsation of adjacent arteries and negative and positive pressure set up during ventilation. And this contraction of the muscle is the big one because that gives rise to the very high pressures. If the valves aren't working, there's going to be a backlog of the blood causing chronic venous hypertension. Chronic venous hypertension. And if the pressure in the veins is high, then that means the blood cannot drain out from the venules effectively. The congestion will damp back to the venules. And if the venules are congested with blood, is that going to make it harder or easier for the capillaries to drain? Well, I think you can see it's probably going to make it harder. So here we have an arteriole. Here we have a network of capillaries. And here we have a venule draining from a venule. But because the veins are congested, the blood is damming back to the venules because the blood can't get from the venules into the larger veins. And because the venules are congested, the blood can't get back from the capillaries. So this hypertension will express itself as increased hydrostatic pressure in the venules and in the capillaries, giving rise to the clinical features that we'll look at in the next video.